Okay, so uh, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our sixth uh, Equator College webinar. So uh, thank you for joining us uh, this evening uh, for another design conversation with our very own uh, creative entrepreneurs as well as our lecturer and head of program of CADD. Uh, so thank you for joining us this evening. I hope uh, this session will inspire all of you as before. So with us this evening uh, is Mr. Goh, uh, the general manager of both Manoplus and Timeless Design, and Dr. Alia, a lecturer and head of program of CADD, or we call it uh, Computer Aided Design and Drafting. So it is an honor to have both of you in this webinar. So uh, perhaps you would like to further introduce yourself to the audience. So can we start with uh, Goh? Hi everyone, um, my name is Go. Uh, I'm the managing director of uh, Timeless Design, which is a furniture solution provider for residential and commercial. And at the same time, I'm also a managing partner for Mano Plus and Next Store. Uh, currently operating from B Street, Penang, and also JMB Mall uh, in KL. Yeah, what are you? Ah, okay. Uh... I'm a lecturer for computer aided design and drafting, also the head of program. Um, I also teach um, mostly theory and CAD subjects for uh, architecture and interior design. Uh, my background is actually from building science and um, with a specialization in digital craft. Um, so anything to do with computers basically um but if i were to pick one i think my um specialization would be in simulation um to uh, somehow predict the way that a building can behave once it's already been built so that's me okay. and i've been with equipped for three years now interesting very interesting so today, uh, tonight, this evening, uh, our topics will be in furniture and space design. So when we talk about furniture, uh, furniture is often uh, thought to be the accessories of a home, right? So how, how well do you think they complement each other in the living space? So okay. maybe we can start with Dr. Alia. Oh, okay. Um, well, um, first, I would probably want to explain um, the definition of furniture. Um, just if you go to the dictionary, uh, it basically says moving article or moving object. Uh, so basically something that can um, be mobile, I suppose, um, as opposed to built into the building. Um, but if you look at it from a more practical point of view, um, I would say a person can describe furniture as something that serves a purpose, but also has a decorative uh, aspect and can add value to the uh, building, whether it's a um, bedroom, kitchen, um, living room, so on and so forth. So how well it complements the living space, it, I guess it really depends. First, you need to make sure that it fits the purpose, um, whatever um, purpose you want an object to be inside your house, whether it's for storage, whether it's as a work surface or a seating. And then you look at it from an aesthetic point of view. Um, people will have tendencies to have preference over a particular style. Um, someone would maybe be um, biased towards minimalist design. Uh, and on the other hand, someone can be some somewhat eclectic in their terms of taste. So whether or not a piece of furniture can complement a space, I think really depends on whether it fulfills those two requirements. This, um, function uh, and then the static value so it needs to follow the client's taste definitely and then the designer needs to execute it in such a way that it follows the basic uh, 
elements and principles of design. So I think uh, our students should know this. Huh? So if they can apply those two well, then definitely the furniture can fully complement the living space. I think that's my take on it. Lah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, I think Alia has uh, almost nailed it. But <laughs> furniture being our main focal point of our business, I, I certainly do think that uh, it isn't just an accessories to a home. Uh, well, in, in my opinion, besides of like interior designs, you know, the concept of the interiors, uh, a home can actually build around pieces of furniture. You know, uh, it shouldn't be seen as just an accessory. So, for example, um, when that piece of furniture is is inherited, you know, from the family, or when it is a collector piece, a vintage antique piece, so it doesn't just enhance the overall appearance of the interior, but it also brings a uh, invaluable, you know, values and also make the spaces and the and the home more meaningful. So to me, furniture um, is is a very integral part of a home. You know, we are not doing a show houses, you know, home is yeah. where it belongs. So yeah. furniture can can certainly be a, a, a very important part of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people see it as a form of expression as well. Huh? Yes. They express themselves through furniture. Yes, definitely. Um, because if, of course, furniture is, is uh, you, you bought a, you buy a furniture because you want to use it you want to sit on it but when that piece can bring more meaning to you to the home mm -hmm. then it can be the you know the statement piece yeah it's, it's a it's the characteristic of your home right yes mm. this is a yeah yeah <laughs> thank you it's very very insightful so uh the next one uh is to dr alia so, so because from from your profile, it it really attracted me uh, when you say that you completed your studies in New Zealand, uh, specializing in digital craft. So, what what is digital craft actually? Okay, uh, well, back then uh, there wasn't as strong of an emphasis on uh, computer use uh, when I was doing my degree. So. Digital craft was something of a new thing, almost. So um, when I was doing my bachelor's in building science, uh, there were a few, I would say, specialization that we can choose from, uh, ranging from management, um, from, um, uh, let's say, uh, surveying, um, designing. Um, me, because I found that my strength was more towards uh, using the computer. <laughs> um, I was quite a gamer back then, so I loved the computer. So uh, I chose a digital craft because it just gave me more time to work on the computer. Um, what I learned was a lot of different softwares, actually. It was a mix and match of a lot of things. I did uh, 3D Max, SolidWorks, uh, Revit, AutoCAD, ArchiCAD, um, the popular ones back in uh, early 2000. So um, when you combine all those courses together, they give you a specialization in digital craft. So even my final project revolved around um, how we can integrate the use of computers into uh, simulating a real life building. So my final project was actually assessing how a gym uh, functions okay i had to count every single appliance in the building and i had to figure out how long they were on for and how many kilowatt each appliance takes up and calculate or predict the electricity bill for that entire year and oh. then develop a new case study to to, to optimize it, to save energy. So it was quite tedious, but with the use of 
all the softwares that I have learned, um, it was manageable. So that was quite interesting because I was actually working in hand with an um, energy auditor. So um, not really a creative project, I would say, but still uh, important, lah, especially when you want to consider how our country is moving towards green buildings and sustainability. So yeah, that pretty much wraps it up. Oh wow, that's that's very interesting. <laughs> something something new that I I have learned <laughs> myself. So for for Gore, uh, having a background in business and marketing, so uh, is venturing into furniture and design business a challenge to you? Hmm. I I actually started out in the furniture industry when I was uh, twenty two years old. Oh, so it yeah. was like. 14 years, 15 years ago. So uh, mm. when I first graduated, I always wanted to go into advertising. Okay. Because, you know, advertising or HIV, very cool. <laughs> so my second job, I ended up taking up, a, I had an opportunity to work with one of the best uh, furniture companies in Malaysia. So, um, but at that time, the company wasn't in good shape. So they were difficult times and I was hired as a management trainee and I, I, I did everything. I was the personal assistant to the CEO. I, I helped them handle the export business. So I do basically everything. I even go to their retail stores uh, you know, to stand in for their, for their full-time staff during the weekends. So because of the opportunity to be get involved in a lot of aspects in the business. I think that helps me, um, that eases me into uh, getting familiar with the furniture business, the industry uh, better and faster. Mm -hmm. So, and one thing I was fortunate to do is, was uh, I was able to help out their retail front, their mm -hmm. business for retail. So that also helps me a lot in getting first-hand knowledge with the, from the customers. You know, um, that certainly helps me a lot in uh, uh, helping me to, to, to understand more about what is furniture, especially when I was so fresh back then. So, yeah, being able to be one leg kick <laughs> uh, has really uh, helped me a lot in getting known. And, and the interest grow over time. So I cannot leave furniture now <laughs> because okay. of my, you know, so yeah, that, that, that's how it leads me into this, this industry. All right. Interesting. So we have both point of view and, and both of you are venturing into, into design, uh, interior design, you know, uh, furniture design in, in a very different way. So. When we say it about furniture, it's, it's, it's such an important role in, in a space, especially when, when it's functional and things like that. So what is the major factor a good furniture must have? So perhaps, okay. uh, yeah, perhaps both of you can answer this. Okay. Uh, maybe start with, yeah, maybe we start with Go. Okay. Um, to me, uh, a good piece of furniture should be able to to last for a long time in terms of uh, quality and also from the design perspective. Uh, I mean, for example, I mean, take mid-century modern furniture from that furniture from that era. Uh, they were designed and built in the 40s, 1940s perhaps, and they are still very much relevant uh, to, to until today's in terms of their design, you know, and the construction, the method they use to produce those pieces. So those are very important pieces for, for, for us to learn. So for me, those are very good. Uh, those are good furniture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Natalia? Okay. Uh, I'm probably going to speak from 
uh, the perspective of a consumer. Um, definitely, uh, the first thing that I would look at is the price point. Um, but nowadays, I think there's quite a lot of choices of high quality furniture, especially from the um, local uh, furniture makers. Um, and yeah, durability is definitely something up there that I would want in the piece that I buy. Um, and then um, it, I guess it would have to be of a style that can be uh, timeless, I think. Uh, but that could be just my preference. <laughs> timeless, yes. Uh, um, a lot of people seem to be drawn towards minimalism right now. Um, but on the other hand, uh, vintage is also quite in. So those two, uh, definitely, I would pick um, vintage or minimalist. Um, I'm a bit more eclectic. Um, actually, I don't have a very specific style. But whatever that can be put together and somewhat complement each other, I can just arrange into a single room and make it work somehow. But yeah. Price point, quality, timeless. I think those are my three um, qualities that I look for in the furniture. Yeah, I think I think that's that's the most important uh, uh, quality that that we all are looking for in the furniture, right? So when we talk about aesthetic and functionality, uh, which of which of these actually create value to a piece of furniture in a in a living space or a commercial space, just some some people they would they would look at the, the aesthetic aspects of the furniture in order to choose, but but which one is is really uh, the, the the value of that piece of furniture? Because in the old days, uh, people only look for the, the functionality, but but today. Uh, because of the competition, because of the varieties, uh, choices in the market. So, so would, would it still be aesthetic uh, or functionality or both of them has to be considered as, as the value of the furniture? So perhaps Dr. Alia would like to answer this okay. first. Um, function or aesthetic? Yeah. I would have to say both. Um, I don't think I can sacrifice one for the other. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I'm looking for a piece of furniture, um, first and foremost, I would have to need it in the first place. Um, if I don't need one, regardless of how beautiful it is, I probably won't go out buying it. Okay, so for me, uh, function definitely plays a role. And then aesthetic, um, yeah, I think aesthetic is also important because let's say if I need um, a set, um, a dining set, let's say, um, and there's a lot of choices, but if I can't actually find the one that really speaks to my soul, <laughs> I wouldn't get one. I would probably put it on hold and uh, wait until I find the right one because um, I'm the kind of consumer who would not, um, carelessly spend money. Okay. I will look for something that can last a long time, that can fit into whatever um, design that my interior might have in the future. Maybe I would want to renovate or I want to change the paint color of my walls. Uh, I would need to make sure that my furniture will somehow still fit into that environment. So I think for me as a consumer, I would still need um, both uh, qualities to be satisfied by the piece of furniture that I'm going to buy. Yeah. I, uh, I can't settle for one. I need both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, Go. I, I, I do agree with uh, Dr. Alia. I think uh, both aesthetic and functionality must uh, must be co-assisted. Uh, mm. Uh, just to borrow Dr. Alia's previous comments, price points is indeed a very important uh, aspect in determining uh, a good piece of furniture because it must be uh, value for money because when an overpriced 
artist. Uh, yeah, it may appeal to certain <laughs> audience, but it may not appeal to everyone. So uh, a good piece of furniture can must be also be used for, must be able to be used by most people. Then only it can, you know, be called a good piece of furniture. For example, the plastic chest that you use in Nomad. So those are good furniture because everyone can enjoy using it. So that can also fall under the category of a good piece of furniture. So it it certainly um, has the meets the functionality requirements. Of course, the aesthetic might not be there. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. but somehow aesthetic and functionality must be coexisted. Generally, you know, for for example, when you're designing a dining chair, you must have a the proportion to to create a good dining posture and comfortable to sit for long hours or over the dining. So, uh, but as well, it's light enough to be lifted so that one when they stand up, they want to move the chair, it's easy for them to move the chair. So these are all the functionality requirements. And yet, with the demand um, design, yeah, it must be good looking. So it's I think both are equally important to me. So. I cannot choose one of them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, same, yeah. same as well. Because because when when even if if I wanted to buy a furniture, the first thing I would I would think of is the characteristic how how this furniture give the characteristics in the style that I have, right? So yes. <clears throat> earlier, Doctor Aliat, you, you mentioned about minimalist, uh, where where people now are are so much. A lot of people are now going to minimalism you know and so so it, it seems that every every catalogs that you look at or, or maybe showroom that you you walk you look at it's it's always going to the minimalism kind of kind of thing so is is there really a a, a, a style is there really a a very uh, a very established style that, that people prefer or desire today mm. like like every interior uh, uh, design person whenever people ask them to do a design that's the only style that they will go for is there any particular style that that we have today perhaps uh go yeah i i, I think there's no particular style or the same style that everyone wants to go into yeah. uh, because pretty much this is depends on depending on the the clients so but i can see modern art deco making a comeback this year yeah. <coughs> so, uh, i think it's all over instagram <laughs> pinterest yeah. so i think that is coming back and then of course with a mixture of vintage furniture like uh, what dr alia has mentioned earlier so to make it a bit of uh, more character so i think that style is coming back and another notable one i think is those uh, what we call chubby design those uh, very fat looking uh, chubby chubby um, furnitures or interiors like like the roly poly chair made by, oh, yeah. yeah those those are the direction that i see uh, becoming more and more trendy today. Yes. Yeah, what about Dr. Alia? Uh, um, I don't know. Um, among our students, uh, um, I would say that their interests do lie in minimalism quite a lot. Uh, I'm not quite sure why, uh, but that seems to be trending among them. Um, Maybe if I were to make a conclusion uh, based on my own experience, um, I think it's because uh, minimalist pieces are just so easy to match with other things if they were to decide to mix and match. Um, when you have something so simple, um, it's easy for you to put it into a room and it could probably complement the rest of what you have already in the room. And yeah, um, vintage, I think, is also coming up. Lah. 
uh, yes. from what I can observe, um, especially from what people wear even. Uh, if you observe um, the local tourists around um, Georgetown, they seem to be wearing a lot of vintage clothing. Um, and then you also have a lot of secondhand stores popping up everywhere in Georgetown. Um, even, um, I think um, our current lifestyle is giving a little bit of a throwback to nostalgia and vintage uh, in general, whether it's fashion or music. Um, even cafes uh, like to keep their shop houses looking exactly how it did back in the heritage days. So, yeah, um, if I were to pick two outstanding styles that students and youth prefer, it would have to be minimalism and vintage somehow, both of them. Uh, yeah. Uh, another thing I want to add about minimalism is um, I think nowadays uh, a lot of young adults, um, they, their first house would normally be an apartment. It's less likely they would buy their first property as a um, double-story house. So I think minimalist pieces, uh, because they are so mobile, uh, movable, um, I think the word is nomadic, uh, um, it can easily be arranged into a small space. So I think that's why um, those two particular styles um, are somewhat a favorite among youths nowadays it's just because it's so workable but that's my opinion from observations all right so it's very interesting it's it's true that that uh the nostalgia kind of of things is is coming back you know uh, so innovation is is the key of a successful design project is it true Hmm. Right. So, so for a successful design project, uh, the, the innovation has to be there, right? So, would you would you yeah, talk a, a little bit about about what kind of innovation? What 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 innovation? Because innovation comes from a lots of things. So, Doctor Alia. Uh. Okay. Um, innovation definitely, uh, especially with how technology progresses. Uh, like back in the day, the transition from um, the vacuum tube TV to flat screen took a really long time. But nowadays from flat screen to ultra HD only takes a couple of years. So we're talking about um, technology that is expanding exponentially. So definitely with new technology, new materials, um, new innovation is being churned up almost um, every year. Uh, you go to an expo and you will see new things that you have not seen before in the industry, um, no matter which industry, um, in uh, building construction, in software, computers, uh, and I believe um, even in furniture design, there will be new materials being introduced every day. And then um, on the other side, um, rather than technology being the drive driver for innovation, there's also this um, drive to make things more um, usable or user-friendly. Um, interestingly, uh, I was talking to... Um, my father, who has an extensive background in furniture design, uh, he mentioned that um, some time ago, office chairs used to not have five wheels. It probably had three or four wheels, but that somehow changed because they need to address uh, the problem of stability. So, um, the office chair design transitioned from being three wheel or four wheel to five wheel nowadays, which you observe is the new standard. Okay, just because there's a need for it to become more stable. Um, I guess people working in office tends to wheel around more, so they needed to make the chair uh, more mobile and safe. So, um, and then you can see 
how uh, human needs tend to change. Um, we want to make things more ergonomic, more comfortable, um, that can improve our lives. So as our demand for products uh, become um, more and more, okay, we demand more from our product, we demand uh, more use, more function, then that actually forces the designer to think of new ways to solve these problems. Um, I guess that's how innovation and product improvement is born. And so definitely, yes, um, innovation is, I think, one of the primary drivers to uh, design changes in all industries. Yeah, go. Yeah, uh, Dr. Alia mentioned about nomadic. It's actually one of the one of the thing that I've been uh, researching lately. Okay. Um, innovation, yes, it's a it's a one of the key uh, success. I mean, one of the prerequisite of a successful design project projects. I think. So take nomadic as an example. So we have to be innovative in product design, be it from the materials, um, engineering of the product itself, uh, in order to fit the lifestyle of the user or your target audience. So for nomadic, the pieces have to be durable uh, so that they can move several times. You know, some they, they, they for, for younger generation, they tend to move houses uh, uh, more likely than Thing us so <laughs> so yeah we have to to, to think of an uh, innovative way in designing the products and you know they cannot be bulky products they cannot be bulky furniture mm -hmm. bulky chairs that they want to move around they, they, they don't want that they want it to be they want it to be flat pack but easy to assemble perhaps easy to to dismantle so these are the things that we have to consider so when it comes to mm -hmm. things like this, innovation is very important. So if you need a light chair, you can't be if you need to think of a, a new materials. So all this involves technology, in my opinion. Okay, very interesting. So uh by what is happening now in this pandemic, do you see a drastic change in the way furniture and interior uh, businesses is operated today. Perhaps uh, Mr. Gaw wanted to start first. Uh, yes, uh, at such times, it's, it's, it's tough. So everyone is uh, finding a creative way to sell. So uh, most people, I think shifting to online selling is the way moving forward. But to me, uh, besides of selling online, you know, doing doing it on social medias, I think there's more than that if we want to counter and be, you know, to be sustainable in such pandemic. So, yeah, like what I said earlier on, pro product development definitely uh, is one of the way in uh, in solving difficult. Uh, the difficulties right now so we have to think of the user's perspective so what do they really need uh, for furniture can we really ship it through a normal courier service company it's very hard mm. because those pieces are very big you mm. can sell it online but it's very hard for you to sell them and ship it like what you how you ship a, a, a t-shirt you know fashion accessories so we have to think of the way that can you know, leverage, uh, and and also um, be be relevant to to today's you know demand, and and how the things works. So, yeah, it's more than just selling online. So, I think like if we are targeting nomadic customers, then we have to think of a way on how to ship the products, the furniture easier reduce the likelihood of getting damaged during the process right and how do we ship it cheap, cheaper more cost effective so these are the things that we have to really 
uh, think about and not just like putting any products online and sell it yeah. like hotcakes. I don't think it's workable. Yeah, true. Right? Now, what about Dr. Anya? Uh, one thing that I realized during the pandemic is um, uh, we have realized that our houses are quite ill-fitted for um, online conversations like this. Okay, yes. this actually is a very awkward space in the house. Okay, so that's one realization that um, I had uh, during the pandemic. So in terms of online businesses, uh, I think uh, a lot of online businesses have uh, come to realize that they don't need actually to meet face to face. Uh, we, we have the technology is that we weren't forced to use it. So actually consultations can occur online. Um, when it comes to design consultations with your client. Uh, and we have um, PowerPoint that we can use. We have animation. Uh, some company, um, uh, I think a friend of mine in Singapore, is even uh, going into VR as a tool for uh, consultations with clients. So that's definitely a big step uh, in terms of his design business. Um, before this, he only relied on animations. So now he is going a step further by taking the client into the virtual space in which he designed. So that's one way. Um, another thing that I noticed uh, as a consumer, uh, during the pandemic, um, shopping was a little bit restricted because we can't really go out and meet the designer and tell him what we wanted. So I was um, attracted to these kind of online shops that allow you to sort of build it yourself, um, furniture. So for example, they will give you a choice of, um, let's say we're building a chair. Okay, they will give you a few choices of the leg design, uh, whether it's made from wood or metal, the frame, uh, and then it will let you choose the upholstery. Um, whether it's um, canvas or whether it's um, plastic or leather. And then uh, it still gives the user some control over the outcome. It's not fully customizable, but the user still has this um, satisfaction of being involved in the design process. So I see a lot of this kind of um, business um, or say model um, being around. I see it in custom watches, custom shoes, custom furniture, and I think even custom kitchen renovation. So it's a little bit like Sims. <laughs> um, you get to choose the components that you want to put into the kitchen. And uh, when you have it all together, they'll give you a quote and then they'll come and deliver. So I think these kind of business models is becoming bit more popular just because uh, online shopping has uh, been given a boost during this pandemic times. So I think that's one interesting way that design businesses have moved. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I, I, I also face, uh, I mean, I, I also realized that there are lots of things has changed. I mean, uh, people started to, to realize that they do not need an offices anymore. So they, they started to, to, to do a lot of things at home, you know? Yeah. So uh, so this is a very tough question, I think, for Go. <laughs> so what if you were to hire a fresh graduate, what are the qualities that you are looking for? Well, well for, for us. Yeah, for you. I mean, we always look at the attitude and the adaptability of the candidates that's that's for sure um you know attitudes basically um, determine how the person's you know where where it can where it can lead uh, he or she uh, in the next step of their career be it be their career or, or their life 
and being adaptable, uh, especially in such situation where changes are very frequent and fast. So I think adaptability is extremely important. So if you can adapt to any situation, scenarios, I think that is definitely a plus point for, for, for a candidate, especially fresh graduate. So sometimes, you know, they tend to look at the immediate uh, future, you know, what they would get. So my, my little advice is um, perhaps we should, we should stay true to, to what, what we need. I mean, as a candidate, as, especially like fresh graduate. So for, for a long term future, this is the thing that I always look at. All right. So, Dr. Halia, now you know the qualities that, that Mr. Go are looking for. So, so as, a, as a design lecturer yourself, so how well do you think uh, our students are prepared in terms of the hard skills and soft skills to, to face the real industry? Mm, okay. Uh, well, um, the design projects that I've seen them uh, accomplish, um, they have quite a varied complexity, complexity sorry, uh, from basic uh, residential spaces all up to a large commercial space for their final year project. So in terms of skills, I, I think it's already there. And also they are exposed to quite a lot of software that I think is being used in the industry, uh, ranging from AutoCAD up until 3D Max, um, sometimes even Maya, um, and then SketchUp, Lumion, V-Ray, all that. So uh, in terms of uh, technical skills um, and construction know-how, they might be um, lacking in, uh, how to say, experience. They know the theory, definitely, um, but they need to, I think they still need to uh, gain a little bit of experience and that I think is addressed in their internship. So when they go out, they learn how the real world works and it's not just producing pretty drawings um, on their boards and uh, rent so they do need to address how those pieces are going to be fixed together with what size screws, you know, and whether or not this particular component can be placed there. Is there going to be a wire hiding behind the walls? So those are the things that they learn during the internship. So uh, in terms of soft skills uh, like uh, managing um, communication, uh, they do get a little bit of practice um, by defending their design during critiques uh, in terms of recommendation. And uh, soft skill in terms of teamwork, um, a lot of the time I realize that in group work, you will have one group leader who kind of just takes over. Okay, there are instances like that. Uh, that's where um, a lecturer such as myself would need to step in and kind of mediate. Uh, other than that, I think our students uh, do get an all-around education in terms of uh, technical skills, um, soft skills, and also the experience during their internship. So uh, other than lacking experience, which um, I think they will only get when they start working, uh, they're actually quite okay. Um, this is also shown um, repeatedly when students are grabbed up uh, during the showcase. Um, they already get hired at that point. Um, and it's quite often that that happens. So I think our students are good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, good to know. Good to know. <laughs> okay, so... What, what are the biggest challenges in the things that both of you do? You know, like as a lecturer, I mean, Dr. Alia do a little bit of research as well. So, like, go, you, you manage uh, two, two 
uh, two companies, you know, uh, right, like Timeless and Manoplus. What are the challenges that <coughs> that both of you face? Perhaps we can start with Dr. Alia. Oh, okay. Um, as an educator, uh, especially someone who prides herself in um, uh, using software and such, uh, I find that the pace at which um, software evolve is just so fast nowadays. Uh, like back in those days, uh, if you were a drafts person and you know just AutoCAD, you're set for life. But nowadays, you need AutoCAD, you need Revit, you need 3D Max, and then Revit is even further divided into Revit architecture, Revit structure, Revit MEP. And even if you know uh, up to an intermediate standard of all the software, you still have other competitors out there who know just as much or more. So definitely one of the challenges for me uh, in being a, a Revit, especially um, lecturer, is keeping up with the different version that keeps coming out every year and then uh, having different plugins that uh, feed into the software as well. So just uh, the upgrade of technology and then my laptop um, can't even keep up with the um, demands from the software nowadays. Uh, I need to change my laptop every two, three years rather than last time. You can It can last for five years nowadays, no. You turn it on and then your laptop gets burnt to a crisp because of the rendering demand. Okay. So that definitely is one of the bigger challenges for me. And then uh, secondly is probably getting the students to uh, try troubleshoot um, issues themselves. Uh, back in those days uh, when we were still studying, uh, whenever a problem happens on my computer and I ask my lecturer how to deal with it, he would say, try figure it out yourself. Okay, if you still can't figure it out within like a couple of days, then you come to me. Okay, but nowadays I think students, they tend to want things uh, fast. Okay, I think it's just uh, their lifestyle nowadays. Everything is just so fast. Uh, they want the solution fast as well. So they don't really appreciate the process of problem solving. You know, back in those days, we would have to ask people from forums. We would have to give a call to the uh, software developer. And we had to learn things the hard way. But nowadays, you can just Google. You can uh, find um, a tutorial on YouTube. So uh, in classrooms, whenever they have like an um, error message pop up, and they don't really want to spend time to look for the solution. So that's one thing that I'm finding difficult to convey to students that the process of solving your problem is very, very valuable. And um, I think the answer instantly is actually doing, doing you injustice uh, in your learning process. So I think that gap between myself and the student is something that I find a little bit challenging. <laughs> What about golf? I, I sort of agree with uh, Dr. Alia in terms of the world is moving very fast. Uh, because of technology, everyone is, I mean, most of the people are exposed to it's, it's um, information overloaded. So hmm. when they see it online, <laughs> when they see it, they they, they they will they want to get it so it's very hard to manage uh, the expectation of customers nowadays yeah. you see so that is really one of the uh, bigger challenges nowadays it is the same as managing the expectation of of our partners uh, be it our business partners our colleagues our suppliers so those are equally hard to manage so uh, in terms of business, I think managing expectation of uh, all the parties that we work closely with are the most uh, uh, ch challenging, uh, in my opinion, right? Because it's very hard to keep everyone happy. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah. 
basically that is one of the biggest challenges that I face every day. Yeah. Yeah, I would imagine the customer when they order a piece of furniture from you, they expect it to arrive in like a couple of days, regardless of the complexity, right? <laughs> no, they, they want it yesterday. <laughs> 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 Uh, so because everyone is um you know the exposure is so so easy that mm. everything seems like the click of a, a mouse button yeah but people tend to forget about uh, why we are doing this why we have to take time to do this mm. so yeah that that's one thing that i think um most of us or some of us have uh, lose patience in yeah. Mm. In the past, we appreciate workmanship, so we tend yes. to do it. We we allow we allow time to 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 produce a certain piece of products or furniture. But nowadays, it's like okay, immediately is the word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I I agree with with all these uh customers or clients' expectation. You know, manage, managing expectation is is. Is quite a tedious part, right? So when, yeah, like like just now when Doctor Aliat mentioned about VR, we we remember uh, that clients we actually have have a client that comes to us and says that they wanted to build an app for for people to to actually uh, have a, a space in in augmented reality and put in the the furniture, but but one thing about clients, uh, I mean. A lot of all these clients who don't understand is that they are able to resize the furniture themselves, you know, to fit on the space where in the real furniture you can't. You know, so <laughs> so so when when you see in AR you resize it, it looks really really perfect in the space. But when you order the the real furniture, it just doesn't fit in. You know, either it's it's too big or it's too small. So I think, yeah, I think the 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 convergence of technologies and 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 all this uh, interior design or, or furniture design need to have uh, a, a, an in-depth study, you know, an in-depth study of the people who understand what is going on uh, between the real world and the digital world. Do you agree? Um, yes. Yeah. Right. So, so like, like if you have a VR that they walk through, you know, the I mean, I mean, people would would have that that feelings of of being in the real world, and and everything has to be on that 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 actual measurements, you know, rather than it, it just it just. I mean, it's easy for a, a digital artist to to actually resize the furniture and put it there, you know, uh, in a in a VR space. So so yeah, I think I think the convergence of technologies is 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 really important but but also the, the people who are involved has to understand the characteristics of 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 what the space is all about what the furniture is all about the characteristics of of the furniture right um yes uh, definitely um of course technology should help uh yeah. making things easier it, yes. it's not com complicating <laughs> Our works right yeah, true. so uh earlier on we, we met, you met, you mentioned about we are and then um dr ali also mentioned about um being online you can you can see the products you know you can customize uh, another thing is take for example uh for people that have showrooms so they they can create a virtual showroom so that you know hotels they do that as well nowadays yeah. So you can just click and then it will guide you to to their rooms to the common areas to the to the pool so yeah i mean of course technology should help but i think from the consumer point of view they should also understand yeah. uh, yeah. you know the limitation of technologies so when when especially when it's moving so fast nowadays yeah. so i don't think we can really catch up every day <laughs> what's new what's the you know the latest so i think it's both so 
us as a you know uh, the provider and consumer i think both of us should um, should have a consensus yeah. in, you know if th therefore th that's for sure there are some like small margin you know of errors so i think we live in a real world we are not living in a <laughs> perfect virtual world so i i think again expectation is you know managing expectation is everything so i think we should look at that way when we yeah. are converging technologies and uh, what we do yeah. so yeah basically that's my what i'm thinking yeah. about dr Elia, anything that you want to add uh, about uh, technology and the industry yeah uh, we can't escape from the advancement of technology in fact we need to adapt to it as fast as possible uh, in order to be uh, still relevant and competitive but yeah like mr go mentioned um, it's a bit of a double uh, edge sword um, if you rely on technology too much but you don't have a very strong grasp of how it applies in the real world, then uh, you're just setting yourself up for trouble in the future um, because you have uh, built this virtual object that is impossible uh, to be brought out in the real world. It just won't work. So um, again, the uh, clients and the designer really need to sit down and talk about what's actually physically achievable um, the designer might have a very uh, rigid take to it because he's experienced he knows what's workable and then um, you have the client who wants something that can be modeled but just cannot be built um, so yeah i totally agree with uh, mr Bo that uh, they need to find common ground and um, really agree on what's achievable despite um, what can be pictured in um, visualizations like animation and VR. All right. So I think uh, it's about time. I think we, we, we have a very interesting discussion tonight. Uh, <laughs> so we have a question that comes in. Uh, question from Xiang Si. Uh, he asked, what do you think of the interaction between furniture and space design and human physic uh, psych physiological behavior? And do you think hmm. design students should pay attention when designing? Hmm. Yeah. So, Dr. Alia, you can oh, start okay. first. Um, something that I studied uh, last time, uh, the topic of ergonomics. Um, uh, it relates to how the proportion of the human body needs to be reflected in the products that we use. So uh, even when you look at uh, your chair, the space between, uh, no, not the space, the length of your legs um, is taken into consideration. If your legs cannot touch the ground when you sit down, eventually it's going to cause you some injury in the long run, okay? As someone who's very petite, okay, I'm only five foot tall, um, often I find trouble uh, fitting into normal sized chairs. Um, my legs, uh, if it doesn't touch the ground, is going to give me a lot of knee pain, especially if I'm working for a long period of time. So here, um, I appreciate adjustable chairs, uh, especially office chairs. Lah. So yes, you really need to understand the proportion of your client's body. Okay, uh, someone from Europe, okay, will be able to reach a higher cabinet compared to someone who's from Asia. So really, you need to understand the uh, proportions of your client's body and the the size of your hand um, as composed as opposed to your own okay it actually has been studied um, proper proportion of your legs to the chair your uh, entire length of your body to the bed everything has been studied 
So as a, a student, maybe some students are not aware that um, certain things are sized the way they are because of the human body. So definitely this is something that you need to look into. In fact, uh, when you are doing your final project, I recommend that you actually measure yourself and try to see if your design is compatible or not uh, with your own body. Then you can find out firsthand whether or not it will fit your client. All right, thank you. Go. I, I will welcome the students to come to my showroom and do the measurement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Doctor Alia is spot on. Um, they, those measurements, uh, some of them are, are more or less fixed. For example, a height of a table, a height of a bar counter. Those are more or less fixed. Of course, there are a few inches of variances. So, yeah. Those are the criteria requirement to make a good products. Because if the products can only be displayed in a museum and cannot be used. So yeah, those are good design, but are they a good products? So those are the questions that we have to constantly ask ourselves. So we do customize for, for customers, but uh, we our role is always give um, a technical uh, suggestions to, to our clients some of them are architects uh. <laughs> so those are the things that we we, we are doing daily uh, to make sure that the users are really comfortable using it uh, instead of just for the aesthetic point uh, it's very important okay so we have another question from Jai Jaivir Singh uh, what are your ideas on creating a set of furniture for the new norm yeah. Hmm. Can, can I start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. When people are spending more time in at their own home, so um, for especially those that are working from, which are the new norm nowadays, so we should think of. Uh, I mean, from my research. We, we should think of a more flexible piece of furniture that can be used for many ways. A table that can be used for a working desk as well, can be used for other other purpose. So, and because houses are getting smaller and smaller, so we should, we should uh, definitely think of that direction to be more purposeful and flexible when it comes to design. Uh, to utilize you know the small space that we we only have or the mm. small budgets that we can only afford so it's like a few birds uh, a stone for killing a few birds something like that mm. okay so this is what we as a company are looking towards as well okay all right Dr. Uh, the new norm uh, definitely uh, it's something that you need to think about uh, when you design furniture like even right now um, I am using a normal stool which is very uncomfortable but it's the only kind of chair that I can take into this current space so if you can design a uh, JV was it if you can design yeah. for me a chair that is small but comfortable and can work as a work chair and Thumbs up, but right now this is all I have. <laughs> and um, definitely um, during the pandemic, I think a lot of people are looking for multi purpose furniture, uh, something that we can use to dine on, but at the same time, something that is comfortable enough for us to use as a workstation. And um, yeah, uh, especially considering the limited space. Uh, you might be sharing a house with uh, your husband who is video conferencing in the next room or you are sharing a space with your child who is uh, attending online class with the teacher. So we all kind of need the same kind of furniture but you cannot, you cannot have duplicates of the same furniture in the house that would be taking up too much space. So definitely multiple 
multi-purpose furniture would be a great help during this uh, new norm. All right, very, very good answer. <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> okay, so uh, the last one, uh, what, what is, or what are your best advice to the audience out there who are interested in becoming the next uh, furniture designer, interior designer, uh, or, or a cat person? Any advice to them? Dr. Alia? Maybe you can start this. Uh, okay. uh, don't be afraid to ask questions because that's the only way that you can get opportunity. That's the only way that you can get knowledge and to get new doors to open for you. So don't be afraid to ask questions, especially in my class. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that's it. Stay curious. That's the only way that you can improve yourself. Uh, go. I uh, fully agree. Uh, in Penang, is stay capable. Okay. So, <laughs> so I think that's the way. Yeah, because uh, you will only get your answer if you ask question. So at the same time, you have to be sensitive to a lot of things. So be curious is another word, which is very, very true. So have to always stay uh, alert to things that happens you know those are very important and try not to rely too much on google try to explore yourself i think mm -hmm. the experience that you gain through yourself it, that is the most important and long lasting okay so uh I think we do not have any more questions from the audience. All right. So I think uh, that's all we have for tonight. So thank you again for the both of you. Thank you for your time uh, to be with us. So thank you. Thank to, you uh, no problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you to, to all who are watching this. Uh, so next, uh, in the next webinar on the 8th of October, we will be talking about uh, street arts, you know, uh, mural arts, uh, how mural arts uh, has become uh, a tourist attraction for tourism industry, All right? So we will be featuring uh, Vincent Pang, our own uh, lecturers who are also a mural artist, uh, Bibi Chun, a professional artist, uh, and also Kenji Chai from KL, uh, a very uh, big uh, street artists at the, at this moment of time. So, so tune in on the eighth of October, uh, same time, uh, same channel. All right. So thank you, thank you again for thank all you. of you. Thank you. Thank you.